Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we are going to look at a story that takes us, takes us all the way down to Georgia, and it is bizarre as heck. When a young mother one day went shopping to, to a Target. Well, there'd be more Targets that day than just the store. The Snellville police were soon called to that Target, to the Targets, and there was something smelling weird in Snellville when witnesses would describe a man calmly fleeing the scene, not a bother on him, in front of plenty of onlookers. Why would they be so calm? As always, there's more to this than meets the eye. Now let's meet the story. Let's give it a go. The city of Snellville, right, is our setting for today. And as we you know, we go through Mike's patented geography lesson. I gotta tell you, Snellville, you got a serious problem. Just change your name. It's not good. It's named after some guy from London named Thomas Snell, but I mean, come on now. It's located about 40 minutes northeast of Atlanta. About 20,000 people live there, call Snellville home. And probably the most interesting thing I could find that happened there, other than in this case, of course, was a former mayor didn't pay his taxes and used mayoral campaign funds to pay for porn sites. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? What an idiot. Who pays for porn these days? The town motto is Snellville, where everybody is proud to be somebody. That kind of, oh, okay, you know what, Let, let's just move on. Let's move past that. I can't, I can't anymore with you. Let's move on to 2009, April 26th of that year. That early evening, it was a beautiful spring day, about 80 Fahrenheit, 26 Celsius. There was a light breeze, but it was dry. And the parking lot of the Target, which lies just north of downtown, it was busy. See, it was a Sunday and people were out and about, many doing their shopping for the week that lay ahead. Just about 6 p.m., an SUV pulled into that old parking lot. Inside was a woman, alone but not for long. She was driving to the parking lot, as that was a prearranged site to pick up her her son, who was about one and a half years old. See, the woman Heather, she was going through a divorce at the time. The arrangement Heather shared with her soon-to-be ex-husband, you know, Heather, the mother, she was the primary custodian, but the boy's dad. He would get the little guy out weekends, and now hence, as a Sunday evening, she was going to pick him up. She was there to collect, and they always did the handover in public places, and the handover was always, like, real quick. No kind of, like, small talk, you know, <laughs> some weather, none of that. None of that. This was no bueno. As I said, this was a very public place. This was on a little strip, so there was not only the Target, but plenty of other stores. And on a nice spring Sunday evening, folk were out and about. Which is what makes what happened all the more bizarre when a single shot rang out. Soon there would be myriad calls to the police reporting this, reporting what they had seen because a lot of people had seen. There is a target on 124. Someone just got shot. You can't miss it. She's laying at the back of the car. She's on the ground. What about the body that she got shot? Heather lay on the ground of the parking lot covered in blood, while the person that had done this to her was calmly exiting the parking lot. Not running, not trying to hide, just strutting out like they owned the place. And by the time the authorities arrived, Heather had breathed her last, lying on that cold asphalt. The killer had gone. You want to know what was even more frightening? Heather's 19-month-old son was in the back of her car. She had gone, met her ex, taken the baby, placed him in her car, and then been shot in the head and shot dead. Nothing was stolen, her money, purse remained behind, no shell casings were left behind, no nada. Snellville was a small town with only 10 murders going back. Not a dangerous place with gangs and shootings and yada yada yada. Police quickly identified the victim as 25-year-old Heather Strube, daughter of Buddy and Mary Allen. Heather was born April 1984, an Atlantan by birth. She had two younger brothers, Hunter and Henry, and was a pretty bright, happy-go-lucky gal. Did well at school, made lots of friends, and would meet her future husband, Stephen, at a youth group. High school sweethearts became husband and wife at a fairly young age. Heather was 20, Stephen 21, and the families got on well together shared values, hopes, and dreams. Heather became a florist, working at the flower store that her parents owned and ran, and she later opened up her own store, if you can believe that. Stephen worked construction. 
It was three years into their marriage that they, you know, they had a son together, a son named Carson. It was a dream come true for the Stroob family. Steve was busting his ass, you know, at the construction site, Heather managing, managing and running her own little flower shop as a florist, and she would have baby Carson in with her every day because she ran the store. She'd basically do what she wanted, and they even built a, a little playpen in her flower shop for the baba. Steven's mom would help out a lot too, Joanna, and she would make deliveries for the florists, help out with her grandson, whatever needed doing, she'd do. However, unfortunately, as we see all too often, the marriage went from good to not so much, with the stress stresses of, you know, having a young baby, running your own business, money, everything. They don't make things easier, that's for sure. They did work on it, they went to marriage counselling, but it can only do so much, especially when one half of the marriage is already halfway out the door. Joanna Hayes, Stephen's mother, she was as helpful as a hole in the head. She was as helpful as a third nut. She would constantly tell Heather how to raise her own child, constantly nagging, constantly like, even just taking the grandson off with her without telling anybody, oh, off you go. Heather would be like, what are you doing? Where are you going with my son? Don't worry about it. I mean, even Stephen Stroop Sr., who was, you know, Stephen Stroop's dad, ex-husband of Joanna, he didn't have very nice things to say about Joanna at all. She was a nutbar. But things really came to a head, Valentine's Day 2008. See, Joanna just happened to find a receipt. A receipt for some jewelry Stephen had bought. So Joanna gave the receipt to Heather, saying, hey, Stephen probably bought you some jewelry for Valentine's Day. If you don't like it, bring it back. Only problem was that Stephen hadn't bought Heather shit. Heather quickly assumed he was seeing somebody else, and she was correct about that. Divorce followed, one that didn't start pretty and just got more busted from there. Heather began seeing a new guy, Mike Vickers, and, and that was going well. She got primary custody of baby Carson, and at weekends, she would hand him over to Stephen and Joanna too. This happened every weekend, until Heather was shot dead in the Target parking lot. Stephen handed the kid over and then left. Heather was still placing Carson in the back seat when a man approached Heather. Witnesses say they spoke or rather shouted, and then a single gunshot rang out. I saw him turn around and with a brisk walk, head towards her okay. car. Then what happened? He approached her while she was closed at the back door and she backed up facing the suspect still, closed the front door, walked around the front of the car, closed her driver door, Okay. and then he stood in front of the driver door. So was he keeping her from getting in the car? Yes. So he was leaned up against the driver's door? Yes, but he okay. wasn't a big guy. Could you hear what he was saying? No, I couldn't hear any of that. What about body language? Based on their body language, what do you think was going on? She seemed startled, taken aback, I think confused. Right as I passed her and him, um, my window was down and she said help. I noticed his hair because it was poofy and it was really, really dark and he had a mustache on and it looked really, really fake. Okay. And I made the comments to my parents saying, oh, look at that guy's mustache. Kind of being a joke and my entire family turned and looked. Witnesses who had been on site when Heather got shot all said, you know, this guy, he approached her, seemed like he was making a beeline directly for her. It was a white guy. And then after the shooting, he started walking back towards the target, but uh, was like walking around behind the target, where there was a small car park located as well. Likely, they had a vehicle there, as when the K-9 unit began tracking the scent, it abruptly stopped at a parking area behind the target next to a motel. Now, Stephen was ruled out kind of fairly, fairly quickly, but the idea of him hiring somebody else to do this, that could not be ruled out at all, hiring some lad from his construction site or something. Police also had to speak with Heather's new man, Mike Vickers. He matched the build of the shooter, witnesses described. They also said the shooter looked like he was wearing a wig and a fake mustache, and in walks a bald guy with no mustache. Go about yours and Heather's relationship. It was awesome. Okay. It was great. <laughs> she kept me together. Um, we we planned on buying a house. Who can we talk to or just verify that you were there the whole day and all that? Anybody that's working. He was alibied out though. He was at work 20 minutes away. It seemed like it definitely had something to do with Steven, right? The only person with a motive to want Heather dead. As I said, nothing was stolen. It seemed like Heather was like the target of whoever this guy was. 
And so, Stephen, 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 right, police went to his house, they want, they want to speak with him, but Stephen was very evasive around the police. In fact, the first time the police showed up to his house, uh, he lived with Joanna and Joanna's new husband. And basically, the new husband was the only person there. And he opened the door and was like, Stephen's not here. Then a guy walks up to the house behind the police as if he's about to enter. The police turn around and were like, are you Stephen? He said no and then walked away. He pretended to be Stephen's cousin. The police then caught up and were like, you are Stephen though. Yeah, he was kind of weird and evasive around the, around the police. Um, but yeah, he, he seemed upset that she was killed and kind of yada yada yada. The police didn't get to speak with Joanna at the time though, who also could be somebody with a motive. She was out for a drive at the time when they initially went there. Did Stephen hire somebody? Did somebody in his family want to hire somebody? And before I continue, let me just tell you all about this old video's sponsor, and that, my friends, is Audible. I am genuinely a huge fan of Audible. I can't stop listening to audiobooks, to podcasts, when I'm doing literally anything. And if you are the same, you will be absolutely obsessed with Audible. Audible is the place for storytelling. Its selection is absolutely incredible, from bestsellers to new releases, and it goes beyond audiobooks to podcasts, the very best. Its own exclusive Audible originals, sound bats, they literally have something for everybody. How Audible works is that its members get to choose one title every month, any title, bestseller, new release, and guess what? You get to keep it forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And you also get the latest and greatest podcasts, a huge selection of audiobooks and originals, you can download included titles as much as you like. For me, I try to run a lot, either outdoors or on the treadmill, so it makes exercise just so much more enjoyable if I have a great story, you know, to listen to while I'm at it. It's like my little treat. Lately, I've been listening to The Kind Worth Killing by Pierre Swanson. It's such a great thriller set in Maine with this incredible coastal New England atmosphere and twisting plot where no one is really who you think they are. The story is told from multiple perspectives, so you really don't know where it's gonna lead you. So if you want to get more storytelling you can take with you wherever you're going, Audible has your back with a massive library of absolutely quality content. Please check out my link in the description. New members get to check out Audible for free. That is audible.com slash that chapter or text that chapter to 500, 500 for your free trial. Thank you so much to Audible for sponsoring that chapter. And you know, that chapter, it's like the, the chapter of an audiobook. So it kind of works out absolutely perfectly. Now, let's get back to it. CCTV footage from the parking lot showed the handover, but as it was a moving camera, it didn't capture the actual shooting but it did show Steve leaving the area. But another camera did show the shooter walking to the parking lot and then after the shooting away to behind the target near the motel. And then another witness came forward, somebody, right, get this, who just so happened to be smoking an El Siggy at the motel that was behind the target near where the killer, the killer was going. And he said he saw some shady business behind the target. His name was Daryl, right? And he saw a white pickup parked there, engine running. Inside, he said, was a man. The exact same as the witnesses from the parking lot had described. Hair, mustache, both of which though looked fake. And Daryl said he could see this guy inside, inside a white pickup, Ford F-150, watching the parking lot out the front of the target with the binoculars, keeping an eye out, you know, covert like. He even said he'd seen that Ford F, white Ford F-150 there multiple times in the days leading up to the shooting. That it, they, they had been there like scouting out, you know, military, covert, tactically scouting out the place. And then he'd seen it a couple of hours before the actual shooting. And then he'd seen it after the shooting, what we can assume is after the shooting based on the time he saw that truck there. And the person who was inside that Ford F-150, as soon as they saw Daryl eyeballing them, they hauled ass out of there. Daryl was able to tell the police a few specifics about this particular white Ford F-150 because he was a car guy, knew all about cars, and he noticed that car, that Ford F-150 had a black trim around it, which was like a custom job. They don't, they don't come like that out of the shop. Now that made the police stop in their tracks for a second. Well, for one reason, it's like, okay, we got something identifiable about the car. And two is that they had heard of somebody who also drove a white Ford F-150. They knew Joanna Hayes drove a car like that, so they said to Daryl, Wanna take a ride? They drove over to the house, and yep, Daryl said, That's the car parked outside. That's the car I saw behind the target. A sketch was done of the shooter, and it seemed clear 
that the shooter was not a man in a wig. It was a woman in a wig. In fact, no shit, Sherlock. It looked like it could be Joanna Hayes. The dog-faced woman, the mother-in-law from the depths of hell. The thing is, though, Joanna didn't want to speak with the police. Shucks. She did give them an alibi, though. She said she had left her house at about 5 p.m. She was going to go see her folks, and she'd stopped off on the way to pick up some food. So she was like, you know, wait, check the time I got the food at, therefore I couldn't have done the shooting. However, when the police did speak with her, she was like, you know, kind of giving them this little spiel about blah, 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 blah. She was damn sure to say, Heather. Pfft, man. She sucked. I mean, she really, really sucked. She said, quote, Heather was not a good parent, had inherited poor parenting skills from her own mother, and was not a good parent morally, and wasn't good enough to raise her grandchild. It's great she's gone, but I didn't do it, I swear. So Joanna wouldn't come in, and there wasn't enough to arrest her. Yet. So the police then said to themselves, <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, little Stevie, come here, come here for a sec, you know. I want to just have a, have a, you know, a few words with you, maybe just shoot the shit, it's just those fellas. I want to go back over everything you told me the other day. Oh, and before I forget, yeah, would would you kindly uh, want to just have a goo at some footage from the parking lot that day? Maybe it'll jog your memory. You know, from the day your ex-wife was shot to death mere feet from your son. The Egypt was caught on camera. Who's that? This is a very good thing with Barry shot camera. You know, it looks like her then. Can you? That's That's your mom. And then, well, Shine. Oh my god. I can't I swear to God, I am not I am freaking out right now. Having a look at that picture, he says, fuck my life. I'm paraphrasing. The servant Oh my god. That's your mama. Oh god. Oh my god. Screw that my son's life's gonna be. Because Bob's dead, what, that has a mom and kill her? They then got Stephen to call Joanna, his mother, and see if him confronting her about what he had a goo at would shake the tree a little. Hey! Mom. Hey. 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 I just left the uh, police station. And they showed me the videotape. Yeah. It looks like you. It looks like me? Bob, it looks like you. It looks just like you. Walks like you. <laughs> Why did you do it? I didn't do it. Bob. <laughs> did you do it? Seriously. Do not lie to me. No, I did not. Joanna denied everything. It was then the police took her in. Joanna denied being involved in her son's marriage. A little tinker. Jillian. Yeah. Not again. I'm very honest. I don't ask. I don't, like I said, I have, I have ice down uh, as much as I possibly can. Completely not your bill. I Like I said, I have ice down as much as I can. Okay. I have ice down as much as I can. Okay. Like I said, I have what the two of them do is none of my business. She denied knowing when and where the custody exchange took place. You knew that they exchanged you at Target. Six o'clock here by the weekend. No, sir. You did not know? No. She was, however, happy to talk shit about Heather. I mean, I'm not gonna bash her. Okay. I'm not gonna do it. Remember when I said I wouldn't talk shit? Okay, well, forget that. Because she was a degenerate gambler. $7,000, $8,000 entry fees for online gambling. Some jewelry disappeared that Stephen looked for quite earnestly. Do you ever know of a time when Heather wasn't there for the baby? It's quite a few. Like, I don't know why they was married. Yes. But. What footage? Come on! Oh, my son says it's me? Mm. I just don't believe it. 
You want me to say that? Uh, no. She lying. I don't know, baby. We need to go get his glasses. I think she said you hadn't seen this. This is the, uh, this is going to be the video clip. This is an enhanced version. Just the one I showed on the news, too? Oh, uh, I believe it is. Okay. This is a artist rendering from our witnesses. And that's supposed to be me? I wish my nose was that narrow. It's basically the same facial features. Same jawline, the same chin, same nose. I just don't see it. We know you're not being honest with us about everything. Let me tell you, now's the time. Now is the time. I don't think so. You know how hard it is to clean blood out of a carpet in a bed? Well, I have no blood in a carpet. In but do you, I mean, it's, it's hard to do that. I have no reason to have to clean blood out of a carpet in a vehicle. I would be the least person to have to gain anything by I it. I have Carson every day. No, I wouldn't. Why would I have Carson every day? It's not looking good for me. Well, like I said, when you get your little blood and whatever you're going to find in the truck, let me know. Until then. Okay. Joanna and her attitude walked out and the police kept looking. Kept looking at her truck. Inside, spotless. You could eat off of it. Except one single strand of fiber, which the lab would tell the police likely came from a blonde wig. The receipt she had, you could easily purchase that with time to do the killing. I've already answered questions for you people many, many times. Not gonna answer them all. This is your chance to give me your side of the story. I want to hear it. Okay? And your, your grandson I know. doesn't want, you want him to grow up and find out that his grandmother was a cold-blooded killer? I didn't do it. I've told you the truth. Yes, right here, Joanna. This, yes, right here. Look at this. You want to talk to me about this? You want to talk to me about this? Joanna, look at what you did to her. You shot her in the head in front of her own son. Look at the picture. Don't look at me. Look at the picture. Okay, that's fine. Right. You look at what you did. Yeah, you did. And now this is your opportunity. So you want to turn it? That's fine. It was a few weeks of building up a largely circumstantial case that uh, after that Joanna was finally arrested and charged with murder. Joanna was a no gal. She would never admit to No, Jesus, that's couldn't be. I, you, I should call you guys the crack police because you're out of your mind by trying to think that I did it. Never. But see, it wasn't just Stephen who would go on to finger his own mother. Probably could have worded that better. No, another witness would identify Joanna from a police lineup as the person wearing the wig and mustache. However, the certainty level was between 0 and 25%. Another eyewitness would say, after Joanna's arrest, that when she saw Joanna on the news, it was definitely her she saw that day. One year before the shooting, on Valentine's Day 2008, the same time Heather found out Stephen was cheating, Joanna was delivering flowers with a co-worker, and they were just shooting the shit, as you do, as you do. And Heather just like, you know, they were talking about the weather or whatever, and Heather was like, here, guess what? I know how to kill somebody and get away with it. Not that it has anything to do with anything, but I just want to make sure you know I know. Suck on that. Joanna went on to say that an alibi could be established uh, if a credit card was used at a certain time in a certain place, or you could get a friend or a, fam a fam family member to use your credit card for you, that you should definitely buy a gun illegally so there's no paper trail, destroy the gun after you're using it, and then dump it in a lake or a river or something, and that you shouldn't use a car that has any distinguishing features. Maybe use a very popular model of a car like a Ford F-150. In jail awaiting trial, Joanna also admitted she did it to other prisoners because she wanted to look tough. She admitted it to everybody, it seems, except the judicial system. Her trial began in 2011. During the trial, Stephen Strube Sr., ex-husband and grandfather, would testify that in 1991, Joanna once held a revolver to his head during some kind of argument, and he said she always carried a revolver. Now, the murder weapon has never been found, but it's believed it was a revolver. Daryl took the stand, witnessing her truck there that day. At the end of the trial, Joanna was found guilty of murder, and she was sentenced to life in prison, plus five. Prosecution used your son's own words against I know. you. 
And now he's got to live with that. Because they dangled his son as a carrot in front of him. They told him repeatedly, call your mom, do this, and we will go help you get your son. Are it's, you good with Stephen, yes, your son now? Yes. Yes, I love him. Am I hurt by what he did? No, because if someone told me, place a phone call like this and I'll help you go get your kid. Uh, it looks like you. If I know I haven't done anything wrong, I know my mom hasn't done anything wrong, what's it going to hurt if you're going to go get my kid? For him, for your son Stephen, to assist the police in that phone call, have you forgiven him? Yeah, with no physical evidence to put me at the scene or no DNA to put in anything that I own. The fact that every eyewitness said no, I can't identify her sitting in the courtroom today, that it was a person who was five foot seven to five foot nine, I'm five foot four, 140 to 190 pounds, I weigh 110 pounds. Never weighed any more in my life. And there you have it, the case of an overbearing mother-in-law, case of the mother-in-law from hell. And how she took matters into her own hands in the worst possible way, putting on a disguise, a real shitty one, let's be honest, to do something pretty unthinkable, in cold blood. And after everything, she couldn't admit what she'd done. Still, to this day, she is not. By the way, during the trial, Stephen, her son, you know, he refused to testify. And in fact, he was now saying that the woman in the CCTV was not his mother. No way, Jose, is that me mama? Nope. No, no. Unfortunately, he probably should have said that before he said it to the police, and they recorded it. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it really means a lot to me, as always. So, uh, next video will be up in a couple of days. You know yourself. And please check out the That Chapter podcast if you're looking for more stories, whole, completely different stories we should tell there. Every new episode out every single Monday, so give it a go wherever you get your podcasts. But, uh... See you in a couple of days, so look, hope, look forward to that. But um, all the best, you know, take care of each other and yourselves. Because I love you. Mike out.